around there. So hi, everybody. I'm Marilyn London and uh, membership chairman and board member of the Friends of the Sterling Road Library. And, um, you know, most of you know and have heard this, so I'm sorry, but I just want to welcome you all and thank you for your participation. And if it weren't for you as our friends, we would not be able to have wonderful Shelley with us or any of the other speakers, both in the library, because we are transitioning and uh, on Zoom and we are keeping Zoom on the evenings. There is no plan to make any changes there. Oh, that's and great. For now, we're staying because of the time frame. It just works better for everybody. And um, the programs to go over to make sure you're getting your new, by the way, if anybody's not getting your newsletter, please let me know or Hannah know or somebody know, because it's important that you get that newsletter every week to to be able to be abreast of what we're offering. For uh, the, the important thing for those of you who are going in to the library, the Monday movie that we're having, the Monday matinee on Halloween is um, Miss Wallaby's Haunted Bookshop, which is very good for Halloween. I hope it's as good a movie, but it's perfect for Halloween. And then we get into November, um, and those of you going to chair yoga and ageless grace Wednesday and Thursdays apparently is really popular and everybody loves it Thursday evenings. We were just talking better with Mel and Marilyn. We have a great discussion and the articles for her tomorrow night are fabulous and it's a very small group. So we would be happy if you would join us and then, um, there will be nothing going on during the election time because the library is a place where people are coming to vote. So there will be nothing going on then. And then, Shelly, we're back to you on the 9th, which, uh, which is La Strada. Is that right? Yes, I'll get into that at the end. Yes, certainly. All right. And then after that, we'll go on to the other programs from there. So that's enough for me and um, Shelly, it's all yours. And we, I am so excited about this. I mean, I'm excited about all of them, but this one just blew me away. So <laughs> thank you. Thank you, Marilyn. Thank Hi, you. everybody. It's nice to see everybody this evening. Welcome. Okay. Yes, the film is In Between, In Between, or in Arabic, Bar Bahar, Bar Bahar. It's from 2016, uh, produced in Israel. Uh, the director's name is uh, Maya Saloon Hamoud. She is Palestinian descent, born in Hungary. And she grew up in Deir Hanna and attended Hebrew University and is now living in Jaffa. Uh, the film was funded by the Israeli Film Fund and produced by Shlomi El Kabetz. Uh, now that's a, that's an interesting name to bring up. Uh, his sister was a terrific actress, Ronit El Kabet. She passed away a few years ago. She uh, did a, a brilliant trilogy of films uh, called The Get, The Get, which was about a Jewish divorce in Israel. Uh, it's one I highly recommend. And if it shows up on Canopy, it's, it's certainly worth discussing. It's it's a brilliant film and the other two as well the other two aren't that available that's the problem uh but uh, anyway she she passed away at a young age and she uh was just a wonderful she and her brother were director producers and, and actors and he produced this film which is interesting in and of itself because of the the subject matter. Anyway, the film addresses some big sensitive topics and themes that are very much relevant not just not just in Israel, not just among the Palestinians. It's anywhere. It deals with them in a way that provokes a lot of thought and intrigue as well within the film. It is a revealing portrait of social change in Tel Aviv's Palestinian underground scene, 
also a comedy of contrasts. Uh, it manages to take us through a, a whole gamut of emotions. The Palestinian avant-garde, uh, the oldest, are in their 30s. Uh, this is the, the young people who are making an impact among the Palestinian youth in, in Israel. They live in the urban spaces in Tel Aviv, in Jaffa, Haifa, and Jerusalem. Uh, they came of age, this is a group that came of age in 2000. In film, this represents a new wave of realism. Also in uh, same kind of realism that they're dealing with in Tunisia, in Lebanon, in Amman, with emphasis on freedom and liberation. The young people, the young Palestinians, they do not want to adhere to the old necessarily bad traditions, bad rituals that they call them. Uh, they want to be citizens of the new world. They want to very much function with Israeli society as well. Uh, the word kafaya or enough as it translates to English, an expression of a conscious change that is happening among the younger generation. Kafaya, this is their, this is their uh, battle cry. This generation can no longer continue playing with codes that are relevant anymore. We must put things on the table. This is the director talking. We must put things on the table. As long as we continue to sweep the fears under the carpet, the carpet will rise and we will all stumble into the darkness that overshadows our freedom. If we don't shake out the carpet and deal with things now, it will be too late. Uh, among the topics, naturally, sexual liberation, sexual identity, and feminist consciousness were an integral part of the social experience that allowed this scene, the scene of the Palestinian avant-garde, to grow. The poets that the director mentions in the film deal with freedom as a fundamental part of their writings. Uh, the editing and contrast are relied upon heavily to keep this plot spinning. We get a tremendous amount of contrast between the characters, between the situations, and the editing, I thought was really well done. Uh, you know, naturally, we have Layla or Lila, a criminal defense lawyer originally from Nazareth, whose family is secular Muslim. She falls in love with a modern Muslim man whose love is not as unconditional as she thinks. Then there's Salma, uh, who is gay a DJ from a Christian family. We get a real great cross-section in this movie. A uh, Christian family who discovers a family is not as liberal as she thought they were. Uh, and then we get Noor. Noor, the pivotal character in this film, who is a religious Muslim woman studying computer science at Tel Aviv University. She is intrigued and intimidated. Her fiance is horrified by these secular women she's living with. From the opening scene with the woman doing the de uh, depilitation on the bride to be and explaining how a married woman has to behave, we cut to a <laughs> disco scene that challenges both straight and traditional society. We first meet Lila and Salma at the party. Salma's mother is nagging her on the phone I had to dress and cover herself for a matchmaking dinner. Uh, then we see Noor show up at the apartment the next day. She seems to be everything these two are running away from. These two are running away from. And yet they share the uneasy status of being Arab Israelis, being the other in a predominantly Jewish society. We see this almost immediately when Salma and Layla are at the dress shop and the salesperson treats them with disdain. If you remember when they walk into the dress shop, uh, how the, the salesperson treats them and how Lila has to deal with his, an Israeli lawyer's advances. That was a terrific scene. Uh, he tells her that he's willing to go with the flow and maybe peace will blossom. And she tells him, yes, and we'll do Palestinian folk dances in the street. Uh, I mean, you know, she gets along with him, but it's, it's, she knows it's not gonna work. So why bother? It's basically, it is in Noor that we see much more of a conflict, especially when we see her fiance, Wissam, 
and Layla seems to find a kindred spirit in Ziad. And during the course of all this, the women do bond in different ways. The women do bond in different ways. Um, where was I? I was, sorry, I lost my place. Uh, Nor even admits, uh, during the course of all things, uh, when Nora is alone and dancing to the music, remember we see her alone and dancing to their music, and it's wonderful to see that. You know, she comes alive, and Layla finds her and joins in. The two of them are dancing joyously. Uh, you know, Nora is, is the conflicted one, but she's coming over. She's coming over. Uh, Nora even admits she may not be in love with Wissam, if you remember, there's that conversation. And then there is Salma's situation when she meets Dunya and we realize that she's gay. We now realize she's gay and Noor defends both women to Wissam. And it is at this point that he reveals his true nature and tries to rape and rapes her and rapes her. This is the first of two very important defining moments in the film. Both Salma and Layla know what happened and take care of her, as well as plot their revenge. And at the same time, when Layla meets Ziad's sister and offers to help with her son, and offers to help with her son, I thought that was a very, very interesting moment in the film. She will also see who Ziad really is, making demands on her behavior, the whole thing with the smoking, the whole thing with everything that goes on between them, she resists and gives him an ultimatum, gives him the ultimatum. And the contrast that with Salma's situation when she brings Dunya home, at least they should have been happy. She brought home a doctor. She brought home a doctor. Dunya's a doctor. You know, it's, it's uh, I, even in a Jewish family, you gotta figure, but mom, she's a doctor. Um, anyway, her parents' reaction is another instance of tradition and fear overcoming a changing world. You know, it's, it's, they, they, they are so resistant to what their children are doing and not understanding how the world is changing for them. In that same sequence, uh, mother at the, uh, the mother at the other family points out the importance of family, which so, Salma's parents totally have no concept of. They totally have no concept of what she's talking about. Then there is that moment when Noor goes to the beach. Uh, what, a, what a wonderful scene. At first, we fear for her. We, 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 you know, we see the situation. We fear that way she's going to drown herself. Then realize this is a cleansing moment for her. This is a cleansing moment. Uh, it's a wonderful moment in the film for her. It is here that we see Noor finally individualized as a woman in transition. This is what it represents. You know, it's cleansing. Water always serves to be so many symbols. And especially in this water, it's such a representative symbol that she goes in and it is a moment of transition for her, uh, which brings us to another contrast and the reckoning with Wissam and the defining moment that results. Noor's father, Noor's father, when Wissam comes to him and Noor's father defies our expectations. He defies even our expectations and reveals himself to be a modern and loving man when he defends Noor. She is not the one who has changed, she says to Wissam. She is not the one who has changed, which finally brings us to Layla's final confrontation with Ziad, realizing that he will not adapt to the modern world despite his seemingly liberal ways, despite he will not come over to the other side, so to speak. Uh, the, the last shot in the film encapsulates their predicament uh, as they look at each other realizing that they are the ones in between, neither here nor there, as if wondering, where do we go now? Where do we go now? It is the three of us together joined with others like us because together we stand united, together we can change our world. They wanna change their world. 
Um, the three actresses in the film were all so good. So they were terrific. Uh, Shaden Tambora, who plays Noor, won the Israeli Academy Award for Best Actress for this role. For this role, she won the Israeli Academy, Academy Award for Best Actress. Muna Hawa, who plays Leila, won for Best Supporting Actress. She won for Best Supporting Actress. And, and Sana Jamalaya, who plays uh, Salma, shared a special uh, uh, Israeli Academy Award with the other two. The three of them received the Special Academy Award for Artistic Achievement, for Artistic Achievement. These three are all symbolic, not just the Palestinian women in Israel, but they share the universal problem of finding the right supportive, understanding romantic partner. This is their, this is their problem. Uh, the film shows how preconceived notions are smashed in, how they pursue independence while having to face rejection and blowback from both lovers and conservative families. You know, they're very brave. They stand out and they stand against. Uh, as is often the case, their freedom comes at a price. It comes at a price. And their lifestyle runs parallel uh, to similar scenes across the Arab world in cities such as Beirut, Cairo, Amman, um, uh, uh, Amman Tunis, and others. In all of those cities, it is like a it is like a revolution. The young people are, you know, adhering. They're all saying there is a world out there, and we want to be part of it. We want to be part of it. They want to be part of, of, the, of the world of young people and they deserve their rights. The cinematography does a great job conveying the freedom and vibrancy of the women's Tel Aviv life with bright colors. You get a lot of bright colors and wide open spaces in contrast to the dull colors and the claustrophobic spaces within the village life. When they go to the villages, uh, we get a sharp contrast. The film presents a range of female figures, young and old, town and country dwellers, more traditional and less traditional, while ensuing real femininity and not just one model of beauty. That's one of the beautiful parts of this film is, is it's not about anybody's idea of beauty except their own, except how the women see themselves. Uh, as the director said, my heroines bring their dreams to the screen, sexuality, activism, and liberation from men can be feminist, even if that word does not necessarily define them, even if that word doesn't define them. Many religious women act in a feminist way without calling it that. It doesn't really matter. The point is that each one can free herself in her own way. And she doesn't have to be liberal or secular to be free, which Noor proves. The film was declared, now here it gets interesting. The film was declared haram or forbidden or prohibited, okay? By the mayor of Umm al Fam which is an Arab Israeli Islamic community in the Haifa district of Israel, in the Haifa district of Israel. Uh, and a, uh, a, fatwa, a fatwa was issued against Hamoud, was issued against Hamoud. Uh, it, it's very interesting what they've done with this, with this film. Uh, they've rejected and, and it's won so many awards. Uh, uh, it's done so well. Uh, it, it was pop. It was a, it was a hit with the critics here. It's been a hit with critics around the world, deservedly so, deservedly so. Um, you know, there are so many wonderful moments in the film between these three women, especially one of the most touching scenes is when the two women come home and find Noor uh, and how they take care of her. 
and and you know they're so tender in how they understand the situation and what they have to do for her. Uh, you know, taking her into the shower, all of those things that they do uh, to bring her back. They're so supportive. You know, at first. They're, they're, they're rubbing up against each other and then the three, you know, come together and they understand. And I, I love it, though, when, you know, we talk about, you know, it's not per se a comedy, uh, but it is it is ironic uh, and smartly so when they when they figure out how they plan their revenge on on him, on Wasim, uh, the videotaping. And the and then when they when they finally come down to it and they get him uh, and you know he thinks he thinks he's going to win you know and and when her father I mean I got to tell you I had tears in my eyes uh, any father with a daughter uh, should feel that way uh, when when he defended his daughter and you know you, you know she felt is he, is he going to reject me now too am i you know usually we've come to expect from the movies we see from the 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 things we hear or read that you know she's now uh dishonored her family because she's been raped and just the opposite just the opposite here and it is so it is so realistically done uh and you want to believe that there are fathers out there, whether they're Palestinian or, or just Islamic, uh, that might behave in the same way, that might understand what the world is for their daughters. Uh, so there you have it in a nutshell. Uh, I'd like to uh, now uh, open it up. So who's going to go first? Who's on first, as I always say? Uh, who wants to chime in? and uh, give their thoughts, comments, questions, whatever. I'm here to entertain you. Uh, Linda. Okay, just tonight I received something from one of the organizations I'm involved with. And uh, Lauda is the president. Okay. And in his newsletter, he was mentioning, <laughs> I don't know what year it is, but coming up, the birth rate <laughs> of the Palestinians, um, I always get confused if they're Israeli Arabs or, you know, they're not, <laughs> they're not the terrorists, <laughs> that they are going to surpass the Israelis. And what's scary is <laughs> when you see how they treat women and you see just what is happening with that group of people, if they don't modernize, uh, it's going to be very serious. Yes. So I just thought this book was very timely, especially <laughs> what's going on in Iran uh, with that very brave woman uh, yes. who's, who's she is, she's suffering, I'm sure, and she's probably tortured, but they're, they're sticking up for their rights. And even though they've murdered many, they're still out there. Yes, uh, they've murdered over 200 young people in, in, uh, in Iran at this point. I mean, the university, within the universities, on the streets, uh, they're, they're, you know, they blamed the two young girls that were thrown off roofs. Uh, they, was, they, they would claim that they committed suicide, which was not true. Uh, it's a terrible situation. And it is, you know, what's happening in Iran, uh, the outside world is calling it uh, the first the first true uh, woman led counter revolution, the first woman led counter revolution in that part of the world. Uh, I mean, and it's true. It's true. And this is, you know, hopefully and it, uh, they will they will prevail. Uh, you know, before 1979, uh, they didn't have to wear a hijab. They didn't have to uh, with the Shah. the Shah. And it was after after the Shah was overthrown and the theocracy moved in. That's when they did it. And you have the same problem in, in uh, Palestinian territory with Hamas. I mean, you know, Hamas really has to be overthrown. They are the impediment uh, 
uh, to the Palestinians really modernizing, coming into the world, uh, and you know, being able to get along. It's it's a difficult situation. It is a difficult situation. Yes, Marilyn. You have to you have to un unmute. Okay. I also think that in all of these, when we get into these kind of patriarchal, patriarchal authoritarian movies, that these changes are always going to have to come from the women. And, and this is a, another example of that, um, where the men are really trying to hold on to control and hold on, I guess, I don't think the bottom line is fear. But um, they definitely are trying to hold on to control. And we saw that with, you know, one father, one boyfriend, and one fiance. And yes. they were all controlled. And the one that blew us out of the water, who we thought would be the most controlling, was the most loving. So I think that was a really nice way to put it. I personally would love to see this movie put into streaming with season one, season two, and season three, because <laughs> there would be so much that each of them would have a really great story. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, you know, it, it's maybe it'll lead to something else that will have that uh, serial context. Yeah, yeah I, I but see you're, you're, you're you're right and and I think you know the the reason that the men uh, are resistant is is more than one reason and you know it's it's the the tradition reason that's been they've been brainwashed into that they've been brainwashed into it is the power that they feel they have over women uh, that that resistance uh, and it is the fear it's the fear. At this point, I think they're very afraid that the women will murder them all. Uh, and so they should. Uh, you know, I don't even know if it's that the women will murder them, but the women will definitely surpass in their accomplishments. Yes, yes. I mean, you know, it's, it's, it, is, it is, you know, look, it's, I've said this before, I, I could say it again, there will be, the end of war will come when men and women are absolutely equal, when no, when is men and women are absolutely, I mean, I mean, in this world, in this world, in our world, in every world, I mean, it's just uh, that's what we're going on with. Yes, Linda. I was just going to say, Mel Brooks, it's good to be the king. Yes, that's the way. Yes, that's the way they behave. That's the way. That's the way Wissam was behaving. You know, he thought he was the king. He thought he could do anything. Uh, you know, and violate violate his own Islamic code at the same time. That's what he was doing yes. uh, with Noor. He was violating his own Islamic uh, traditional code uh, with her, uh, you know, to be and to act the way he was acting outside. I mean, it was just, it was just despicable, just despicable uh, to see that. Uh, okay, anybody else? I don't see many, ah, thank you, Marilyn, go ahead. Okay, uh, even though this was about these three particular women, I just felt it was a universal story about the strength of women. And uh, I, I found it remarkable. Of course, the acting superb, but yes. uh, it, it was a universal story. It, it was, you can even see it adapted here. You could see a Mormon, a Jew, and uh you know a baptist <laughs> in a dorm together you know let's see what happens when you put them together uh it's a chemical reaction but you know you might see and be surprised by what would happen depending on their their, their gender roles as well uh but it's it is it is an interesting idea uh, uh and it which makes it universal you can see it as a universal story thank you dorothy Yes, uh, two things I want to uh, point out. I was kind of shocked at the extent of the drug use mm. and the promiscuity of the, the women. Um, I found that a little disappointing and I hope it doesn't, I hope they can 
you know, succeed in their independence, but I hope it's not their undoing as well. Yes, I mean, I, I was mean, amazed that she could, you know, do coke or whatever she was doing and then go to work the next day. You know, yeah. that, <laughs> as a lawyer, I thought that was kind of uh, interesting. Well, the you know, it, go ahead. let me just interrupt before you get into the other point. I mean, it's something that was prevalent here. Uh, you know, it's it's uh, unfortunate, uh, but you know, especially this is a this is a group that is searches for their outlets because of the repression and everything else. Uh, and I agree with you. You know, you hope that these young people will find their way out of this stuff. You know, they shouldn't get so involved with it uh, that they would. But I think it was representative of trying to be representative of what's going on in that society because of the repression uh, right. and the availability of these things. Uh, right. Now your second point. The second point is I wonder if Nora's father would suffer any repercussions mm. from other men for supporting his daughter. Uh, that's a good question. And I think he's, he's a, you know, I think he doesn't care. I think you know if they're if they're stupid enough to reject him. I mean, they wouldn't they wouldn't do anything physical to him. There's no reason to. But if they're stupid enough to reject him by just not dealing with him and coming into his store or talking to him, uh, they're stupid. They're just stupid. Yeah, That's stupidity. Yeah. It's not ignorance. It's stupidity. And and uh, they don't deserve him. They don't deserve him. Uh, so I think he's he he knows who he is. Uh, by standing up for his daughter mm -hmm. and and defying this guy, uh, so I I uh, but I understand and I'm glad you were concerned for him. <laughs> I'm glad you were concerned for him. <laughs> it was a wonderful movie. Wonderful. Movie. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, okay, uh, Nora, it's in your hand. Go ahead. Okay. Well, Nora's fiance, when he violated her, he justified it. He went into the bathroom, saw a pair of underwear or something. And once he justified it, he wasn't going against his religion. Then it was okay. You mean uh, as far as, as he was concerned? As far as he was concerned, he wasn't going against his beliefs. He was okay because she was a whore then. He called her a well, whore. I, well, I'm just saying I, don't know, I don't know if their religion has a, has a thing in it. You can visit a whore. I mean, I, I, you know, I, it's, it doesn't matter. It's just wrong. It's just yes. wrong, you know, whether he's violating his own Islamic code or not, it's still criminal. It's, yes. you know, and, he, and he's wrong, he, regardless of what he, what he saw in the bathroom. You know, uh, you could say, why are you living this way? He could ask any question, you know, and get was, an honest answer. Since it was criminal, why do you think the lawyer didn't call the police? Well, it would be because it's, you know, these, the Islamists and everything else, what you're dealing with. Also for her, I think they didn't want to, they didn't want to oh. embarrass her and bring her out, you know, and do all of this. Uh, they, they, want, they, they had a way of taking, as a lawyer, she was smart enough to take it in her own hands and take care of it. I mean, she did it in a kind of, you know, okay, we'll take care of him. And she had the way to do it. Uh, okay. And I think that's, and also it's the story. It's the story. It's clever. It's entertaining. It's also, yes, it makes us feel good uh, if they do it this way. Uh, because so, to report it, then they have to prove what he did, you know, and it, it becomes he said, she said, uh, you know, and, and that's, you know, it becomes too difficult. It becomes too, too much too uh, difficult that they, what they have to prove. At the old witch trials. Yes, thank you. Thank you, Linda. So uh, I told you I just came back from Israel and and my daughter's best friend is an Arab Israeli girl, uh, uh, lady. And, and um, the Israel, Tel Aviv is so modern. It just shows you how it's different than the rest of the whole Arab world. I mean, it's just every store, it was Arab and Israelis, the waiters and waitresses were Arab Jews and, and Muslims. Yes. It's just a very different vibe there than, than the rest of the Arab world that they're surrounded by. Than even probably the rest of the villages in Israel. Yeah, it's very interesting. 
Yeah, it is. It's it's a cosmopolitan city. I mean, it's it's just and they they want to be part of that world, uh, okay. and it is interesting to see. Yes, thank you, thank you. Uh, I saw another hand Susan, up. What happened to you? Question, Susan. Oh yeah, Susan. Um, yeah, I was just going to say that um, you know there is a contrast with the ultra orthodox Jewish. Yes. I mean, they're not charmers either toward women. Um, in Mea Sharim, like in Jerusalem. Oh, sure. And then the many movies that have been made about that community and the kid that runs away. I think we saw one. I'm not sure. Yes, the one that was on, uh, what was it, on Netflix or HBO? One of them. The, uh, and then, what like, is that, you have Wendy? Oh, wait, Wendy. Oh, what happened to you me? have to unmute. <laughs> She's having trouble. Yeah. Unmute. There you go. Okay. What was this? The film was unorthodox and it yes. was most. Interesting. But I, what I found in this film were these three women. They joined a, they became like a, a sorority of women. They were there for each other, even though they had such opposing backgrounds and what have you but they were a comfort and a and a, a major major help to one another and uh i think it's almost like lysistrata they took things in their own hands right. and they dealt with what needed to be dealt with and they they were successful and at the end i, I like the last film the last part of the film yeah. where they were together dancing in this this hall this uh, nightclub this cabaret or whatever I thought that was a very, very yes. nice thing. Yes, thank you. Susan, did you have anything else? No, no, thanks. Oh, okay. Yeah, no, it's, it's and what you're saying, Wendy, is it is universal. Uh, and Susan, what you're saying is universal because we have those problems here. Uh, you know, when, when communities hey. operate like that, you know, extremists, you know, whether they're, they're ultra-Orthodox, uh, Islamist, uh, even, even, uh, the far right, you know, it's just, this is the way they behave and they separate themselves uh, rather than wanting to be part of the greater society. Uh, How about the far left, how right. they behave too? That too, I won't argue with you, naturally. Yeah. Any, any far, any far side, uh, it doesn't matter. Left, right, top, bottom, doesn't matter. <laughs> <laughs> Anybody else? Oh, Paula, oh, yes. Hi. Um, I love the film. I love seeing the strength of these women and how just extraordinary they were. But I have to say, for me, the highlight of the film was the father and how he behaved. That absolutely blew me away. And I couldn't leave that. I mean, because it was so against his religious beliefs, but he was a father and he loved his daughter. And to me, I mean, I have chills just talking about it. So I wanted to share that. Oh, that's great. That's great. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, I mean, and the idea, the idea, I mean, the, the, the irony that they, they put they put out a fatwa against this woman, the director, is is incredible to me. Uh, you know, how stupid could they be? How stupid could they be? Uh, thank you, Paula. Mel, you had something to add? No, I just want to point out that I don't want to be a downer, but <laughs> the, this, this movie is a very good feeling movie. However, in reality, uh, people are not that way. People, uh, uh, what should I say? People are attracted to their upbringing, the religion that they're given as a child. And we see this in Russia. Uh, the, the Orthodox Church was eliminated when communism came in for a hundred years. As soon as communism fell, the Orthodox Church came back. And the same way with other, this it's probably this other situation. So the well, pendulum back and forth. Well, yes and no. I mean, there are, you know, it's just as we were pointing out, there mm -hmm. are exceptions to the rule. There's exceptions to every rule. And there's a number of exceptions here. Uh, uh, you know, it's it's the the, the extremist uh, um, exception. You know, if a group is extreme and somebody needs to exert themselves and and, and declare their independence, uh, they're not going to go back. 
They're not going to go back like an unorthodox. They're not going to go back. And it's happening. It's happening here. I mean, there are young, young, uh, if we, we choose to choose the orthodox community, uh, there are a number of young people breaking away. Uh, they're, they're not educated to the outside world. We're seeing reports in the papers from New York of what's been happening uh, with the ultra-orthodox. Uh, they're not teaching them uh, how to behave in the world. They're not even teaching them the subjects that are necessary for them to survive in the world. We're talking about math and reading. Uh, it's terrible. It's terrible. So it's in a sense, this is this is the three of them are representative of their society. Uh, and that's what we have to look at. It's no, it's not. They're not all going to turn tomorrow. They're not all going to join in that resistance. But that resistance is growing. That resistance is growing. And I think it'll continue to grow, hopefully, hopefully. That's what we can have hope for from the movie. Uh, Susan Mitch. I've been listening to everybody talk about this and I was thinking to myself that I enjoyed the movie. I thought that this was um, a real feminist movie in a lot of respects, but I also thought it was a, a, a movie where people accepted other people's views, the three women, and they, they grew together. But I wanna just say something in, I don't know that much about the uh, Muslim religion, but it seems to be very rigid and no room for any flexibility. Whereas if you look at Orthodox Whereas, Judaism, um, uh, uh, Orthodox Judaism, you're talking about the ultra-Orthodox, well, there's modern Orthodox, and then there's yes. God, and there's this, and there's that. And you, the ultra-Orthodox are very much like what we're talking about now with, with the no room for change, no room for understanding, no room for looking at what's going on around them, very isolated in, in their beliefs and their community. And um, it, it was really quite a parallel if you look at that. But I thought that these three women were trying to adjust into a society where they were the, I don't know, minority anymore, but they were part of living in a Jewish state and having some discrimination just along with that. And then the discrimination um, with, within what happened. And it was, it was amazing to me that patriarchal society like that the rule was that that was the rule and it, it was really something that um i don't know I, I thought it was a very revealing movie and i think they were uh I, sequels would be great marilyn i'd like a season two and a season three to see the growth <laughs> and the change and what would happen and um i loved it i really loved it you, you bring up you bring up you. Uh, yeah, terrific and, and you bring up an excellent point and is in what you're saying and what I'm hearing is, yes, there's the extreme. There's the extreme, which is the ultra-Orthodox. And then there is the modern Orthodox. There are, there are other, other parts of this. Why am I echoing like that? I was too. Uh, <laughs> uh, anyway, there are, other, there are others, you know, other, you know, parts of this. But the being... Is that me? I think somebody at somebody, somebody has should to, somebody uh -huh, has to doesn't like what you're saying. <laughs> Obviously, <laughs> I'm being I'm being. Uh, Mohammed yeah. is watching. <laughs> yes. Ah, um. Anyway, uh, what I it's still coming through. Let me. You're the full speaker. Well, okay. Has this? So somebody up? has two things at the same time, so it makes an echo. Maybe they have an iPod and in and the, and the computer at the same somebody, time. Somebody, two things. Um, somebody in the group. Hopefully, hopefully, hopefully. Anybody's in here twice. Take yourself out once. How's that? Is that any better? Yeah, it's not happening. Better? Okay, good. Okay. Here it goes again. I don't understand it. I don't know what's going on. It's not me. It just started. Seems to be a Why doesn't everybody mute themselves? Okay, that's a good idea. Let's try that. Okay. That, no, it seems to be me. Uh, I will. Let's see if this helps. Well, I apologize. I don't know why this. I think 
my computer has arthritis. I don't think it's your fault. <laughs> <laughs> okay, let's see. Even if I lower my volume, uh, yeah. it, still getting it. Carry on, just in case. Of... Oh, it's good now. It's yep. good now. You can all hear me. Yes. Yeah. Oh, great. Anyway, so where I was going was, I think the women want to first be identified and maybe solely be identified as women, as who they are. They each have an identity, and has nothing to do with religion. It has to do with who they are, being a human being and, and being treated as another human. Uh, I think, you know, you were getting somewhere when you said they're the other, because in effect, that's what they see themselves. They don't see themselves as the other. They see themselves as, hey, I want to be part of this. I want to be part of the society. I mean, even, even um, the lawyer with the, with the Jewish attorney, you know, and, and she likes him. But she says, this ain't going to be. This can't be. And it's not because of him. It's because of his family. It's because of the society and the way it's structured. And this is, this is what has to change. This is what has to change. Now, yes, there is strict Islamic law. And there is liberal Islamic law. Uh, I've seen films where, uh, where fathers have behaved like him before in saying, look in the Quran, the things they say aren't there. He keeps looking. I, I saw a film years ago where the father says, I've looked in the Quran and I don't see those things uh, that you're telling me. So, you know, it's, it's playing it back against them. And I think this, this does a good job of it because the father, he's not dealing with the Quran, he's dealing with humanity. This is my daughter. You don't treat my daughter this way. You don't do this. Uh, and I think that's the important thing. It's not about being, you know, he could be a devout Islamic, but he's a father. He's a father. My daughter is a girl. My daughter is human. And I treat her as such. And I will expect that a man that she would like would treat her that way. Uh, so I think that was, a, that was an important statement that he was making uh, because it was not so much a religious statement. This was a father's statement. And it was a familial statement. And I think that's more important than anything else is, is his uh, ability to do that uh, without saying, look, I could be, he could be a religious man, it doesn't matter. That's not what's important here. What's important here is don't bring your religion into this as an excuse, as an excuse. Uh, and that's what these three women are saying. We're not, it's not about religion. It's about behaving in society. Uh, and that's where, where I think we net out with this film. And that's what's important for the director is, to, is that these women see themselves as human beings in a world, uh, regardless of, of, of what they believe in, regardless of what they believe in. Uh, so anybody else have any other comments they'd like to make? Because you're all making interesting comments and I'd like to hear more of them. Uh, yes, Marilyn. No, I think that if we're looking at the three women and trying to see how they would stay um, with the religion from which they were brought up, uh, I think I could see Noor staying some the most with her religion. She might be a little bit more flexible, but I think she will stay within it. I think the other two have a chance to possibly stay with it or go with it. I don't see that they would be as rigid. Each one would have a great subplot, um, but I think that there would be one. I think North would probably stay within the confines of her upbringing to an extent. Yeah, I think, I think you're I right. Think Although I will tell you, she's studying science, that she's studying science. Right. That's a big step. Uh, for a woman in that society, let alone a, a Muslim woman in that society, you know, to take science courses, to, to move towards the science. Uh, you know, I, I, was, I was reading today a very interesting piece. Uh, it was a, in, in the New York Times book review, but about the fact that uh, in Germany in the 19th century, 
uh, that uh, because the reason that a lot of the Jews became assimilated was because they were they were gravitating towards science, towards uh, what was becoming modern at that time, the vision of the modern world. And that was, uh, that was, they were stepping in, in a sense, stepping into another world. We, you know, naturally we talk about the visionaries, we talk about Freud, uh, we talk about the scientists, but there were young people that were all gravitate, gravitating towards them and not relying so much on their religion anymore. Uh, and I think that's, you know, that's an, a sign of evolution in a society that wants where people want to be assimilated. And I think the two of them were heavily assimilating into the society in the film. Uh, you know, her being a lawyer and, and where she worked and everything, and with her family as well, and also, and especially Sama. I mean, she was a totally modern girl, uh, you know, and, and uh, who was finding a way and realizing, you know, I'm gay and uh, figuring, okay, you know, my family has to understand me. And in fact, the way her father behaved was very poor. Um, you know, the, the mother uh, was caught in between. She was caught in between. You know, there were a number of people caught in between here. It's not just the girls, when you think about it. It's, it's other characters. Uh, Louis' father is in between. He's in between the old traditional world and the world of accepting his daughter and not dealing with these old, you know, bad ritual traditions of how to treat women. Uh, so, so we get this. And, and uh, this, I think that that title is apropos across the board. I think we're all in between in some way. We all fall in between in some way. Uh, so anybody else? Thank you, Marilyn. Anybody else? Yes, Linda. I don't know if I could express this, but it's the, I guess, the uncomfortable feeling of where they are, not being, uh, not going with it, uh, that makes them fight for what they what they want. But I was thinking. You, we never seem to put the word happy on any of these people. And happiness is relative. Um, but with so much going on, you know, the, the undertow of their religion and, and getting away from it, um, maybe even being ostracized by other people in their family or friends, uh, we never seem to use that word, you know, as a parent, you want your child to be happy. There are other things, other virtues that you would like, but to me, that's the, that's the important thing besides health. And in most of these instances, I couldn't really put that in their frame, the happiness part. It, the drive is there and that's what makes them uh, continue with their fights, but they have one life. Are they are they content? Are they happy in this life the way it is? They see all the problems. I think it's an it's a very interesting comment. You know, happiness is transitory. It's you know it's here one minute and it's gone the next. Uh, a lot of people in the last in the last two and a half years we've had a hard time dealing with happiness. Uh, but the 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 fact is that. Yes, they have the drive, they have the willingness to, to, to separate in certain ways. And I think that leads, hopefully, to happiness. In other words, when, when they are so self-defined and when they find a significant other, whether it be a man or a woman in this case, because we saw, we saw Sama happy with the doctor. We saw moments of happiness. We saw, you know, we, we, we see... We see uh, nor, you know, whether we want to be, is happy with her father, you know, that her father, you know, takes her in his embrace. That's a moment of happiness. It's that transitory moment. Uh, and I think that's important. Uh, and I think, you know, it's, you, you said it at the beginning of your statement is that in this, in this particular society, you know, finding happiness, it could be difficult at best. 
And that will come. We have to hope that that's what comes in the alliance. So thank you for that. Yes, Susan Metch. And then Susan Mann. Guess Susan Metch. Susan, unmute. Metch. Susan, unmute. Yeah, you have to unmute yourself. Okay, I'm sorry. I was just being good. I'm keeping mute. So I just find it a, a thing of evolution. They're evolving. It's a constant evolving of these women in the situations that they're in to find a place for themselves. Um, and when they do, they will be, quote, happy. But this is not an easy situation. Um, there are a lot of pressures coming all, all from all sides. And I agree with you, Linda. I, I've always said with my children, health, happiness, I'm happy, they're happy, it's fine, it works. Right. And that's with my grandchildren too, it's just, that's perfect. But these women are not up to that point yet. They're in a growing state. That's what I look at it, they're evolving. So that's all I have to say. No, you're, you're, that's exactly it, they are evolving. Well, it's not that they're evolving, the society's evolving. And that's, you know, true. Yeah. that's what has to happen is they all have to evolve. Uh, mm -hmm. you know, and you're right. The first thing, the first thing we ask about children is, are you happy? Are you happy? And if they're unhappy, we're unhappy. So it's, that's, that's really the bottom line. Thank you, Susan. Susan Mann. Okay. I think all three women, um, felt this freedom by living in Tel Aviv. Um, I think Noor with her happy dance was uh had become the happiest of all and she'll go on with her career and this is you know i mean they'll only be good for her the other two the the gay one might find you know if she goes back she can't go back to her community now i didn't they say something at the end about going to berlin yes yeah, she wanted to go to germany yes yeah, she wanted to go to berlin yes right and um, and I think that, you know, it's sort of like uh, if you send a kid to a, a parochial school, all girl parochial school, and then they're free, they go a little wild. And these girls have gone, well, not all, not nor necessarily, but the other two went a little wild. Um, but I think they'll all find their happiness. And are any are evolving, and I think we see that on this screen. Yes, yes, we do. Uh, that 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 is the point of the film. Uh, but they are in between. They are in between well, the evolution right. and pull the pull that on the other side. You know, they are in between. It's that's why the title is perfect, and I I don't think they changed it from the original title, which they usually do when they bring a film in here. Uh, so I think that's that's uh, a great distinction, uh, but you're right, you're right. Uh, Bill, you want to tell us about the next one? Yes, I do. And be, before I do, let's just hope, you know, we deal with so many problems. And Marilyn, you're talking about, you know, serializing this, this whole, their <laughs> life, their lives, you know, because there are issues we don't get into in here. And there are issue, other issues, issues that are affecting us as well you know, abortion, all of these things. Uh, and uh, if you're in the neighborhood next Tuesday night, uh, I will, if those of you who get my newsletters, you'll see it, and I'll be at Aventura with a, a very important film that comes out of France this year called Happening. Happening, and it takes place in the 60s, in 60s France, when they were, uh, when abortion was uh, totally illegal in the entire country. And a young university student is now faced with being pregnant and not wanting to have a child uh, and what happens. Uh, but it is a, a definite reflection of what's going on here. Uh, and I, I purposely, for those of you who know me, I purposely programmed this film a week before election day. Uh, wow. so <laughs> I, at that audience, it would be nice. <laughs> we're, we're in Aventura, Shelley. The Aventura uh, Performing Arts Center. Oh, okay. I know that. Sure. 
Yeah. Uh, it's next Tuesday evening at seven. Okay. Uh, anyway, uh, next week, uh, next week, sir, the film in two weeks. Okay. <laughs> uh, we get back to some roots uh, and I'm excited about this because to me, it's, it's one of my favorite films, uh, classically speaking, La Strada. La Strada. Um, Many of you may have seen it a long time ago. Mm -hmm. uh, and hopefully don't remember it all when you watch it again, <laughs> or you'll look at it with a different eye. Uh, and we will certainly look, look at it with a different eye uh, with all the backstory I'll have. But, you know, it won, it was one of the uh, first winners of the Best Foreign Language Film Oscar. Uh, it was also nominated, interestingly enough, in 1957 for Best Original, Best Screenplay, Best Screenplay. Uh, it is one of the most acclaimed films of all time. Uh, Fellini, Federico Fellini brought together Anthony Quinn, Giulietta Massina, his wife, and Richard Basehart uh, in, in what uh, is nothing less than bravura performances as a strong man, uh, a young woman he buys, he literally buys from her mother, and a man who plays the fool. Uh, it is a classic and tragic tale set on the back roads of Italy. It is a great road movie. It's a great story. Uh, and it's, uh, it, will, it will create indelible images. But not only that, it's also the beginning of what would be called Fellini-esque. It is also the first film that begins to define what it means to be Fellini-esque. Uh, so I will look forward. It's as well as Canopy. It is available on HBO Max. Oh. For those who have Criterion, uh, it's also available on Criterion. So I will look forward in two weeks to seeing you for that film. Uh, we look forward to seeing you again. Thank you. And all thank of us you as all. friends, thank, thank you. you. And hopefully those of you who are joining us who are not friends, become a friend and join us again in two weeks. Well, they're still friends. They should be ultra friends now. <laughs> <laughs> oh, extremism. <laughs> Sorry, but in this case, yes. <laughs> right, thank, thank you, Shelly. Thank you, so much, thank you Shelley. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Have, a good, have a good rest of the week. Thank, thank, you. You. thank you. You too. Bye-bye.